dass ich erlebt habe auch selber, dass ein Teil Deutschlands von der Sowjetunion kontrolliert wurde. Und ich bin sehr froh, dass wir heute in Freiheit vereint sind als die Bundesrepublik Deutschland und dass wir deshalb auch sagen können, dass wir unsere eigenständige Politik machen können und eigenständige Entscheidungen fällen können. Well, you're not going to be independent for long when Putin decides to shut down that gas line. Did you hear an answer to Trump's actual charges or questions? I didn't. As the American president, Donald Trump is over in Europe looking out for our interests and, of course, for the independence of our allies, which he thinks is really important, and rightly so. The free rider days have come to an end. Americans elected Trump in part because they wanted to make sure that the billions that we spend overseas are billions very well spent. What a novel concept. But you'd have thought that Trump had worn a Russian flag t-shirt to his NATO talks, given the hyperbole wafting from 30 Rock today. Donald Trump is the most vivid manifestation of the least attractive characteristics in the national character. We haven't been captured by Donald Trump. We have had our worst instincts affirmed, exacerbated, and put in front of the world. He could not be doing Putin's bidding more effectively if he were an active agent of Vladimir Putin and the KGB. It's all coming uh, to, to fruition, and it, there is a basic reason why Putin wants to do it. In President Donald Trump, he has an American president who goes at NATO, hammer and tongs, and, and in a sense does Putin's work for it. What a ridiculous comment. Asking our allies to pay their fair share is, is going at NATO, hammer and tongs. He's actually trying to strengthen NATO by saying, We've got to keep this alliance together by keeping our military expenditures what we pledged to do and, and keep those at a level that you know is fair for everyone, 2%. But I gotta tell you, this was perhaps my favorite of all the criticisms of Trump's NATO meetings today. What's the role of misogyny here? Uh, does Merkel remind him of Hillary? Uh, does that help explain the Theresa May issue? Uh, He does not have a particularly uh, a healthy relationship, it seems, with a lot of strong women. Oh my gosh, John Meacham is like, uh, I really like John Meacham, he's a respected biographer, historian, but that was just stunning. Yeah, yeah, John, that's what it's all about. It's not an unseemly energy deal that imperils Eastern Europe or a country that's been undermining its future safety while asking us to pay for their protection. It's all about strong women. Oh my God. Well, here's an observation from one. Mueller has come up empty in his quixotic quest to find Trump collusion with Russia, but perhaps he should turn his investigation to Germany, where politicians, current and former, are all too happy to sell out their own people for cheap Russian gas. Well, I won't hold my breath waiting for that probe to start. And in the meantime, I'm glad we have a president who is unafraid to upset the apple cart over in Europe and call out truly dangerous international collusion where it exists. And he's actually willing to do something about it. And that's the angle. Joining me now for reaction, Michael Santo, a researcher in international studies at the University of Miami. In London, very late, Rahim Kassam, former chief of staff to Brexit leader Nigel Farage. And with me here in studio, Waleed Ferris, Fox News national security and foreign affairs analyst. Well, Lee, there's a lot to unpack here, but the criticism of Trump today was so overwrought, so over the top, so unhinged, it, it's like it's seamlessly dovetailing from the unhinged criticism of Brett Kavanaugh two days ago. We move from topic to topic with more overheated rhetoric. How is Donald Trump cozying up to Russia by saying, let's strengthen the military alliance of NATO? Absolutely, by also ordering a deployment in the Baltic states, by increasing the sanctions on Russia, by making sure that Iran is not going to get our dollars to buy what? Weapons from Russia. Is that being causing to Russia? I don't think so. Uh, Rahim, I want to go to you. This is what President Obama and President Bush both said about the need for each member nation to pay his fair share. Let's listen. The majority of allies are still not hitting that 2% mark. Everybody's got to step up and everybody's got to do better. 
Building a strong NATO alliance also requires a strong European defense capability. So at this summit, I will encourage our European partners to increase their defense investments to support both NATO and EU operations. Okay, so Raheem, they just, you know, they said these things, and then nothing ever happened. Donald Trump noticed that, and he said, uh-uh, no more Mr. Nice Guy. This has got to get done. Now he's upping it to 4%, which sent everyone into paroxysms of outrage today. Raheem, how are we seeing it from Britain tonight? Well, how do you get to 2%? You obviously go to 4% first. That's a, a, a basic negotiating tactic. Anybody who knows how to haggle will tell you to do that. But it, isn't it interesting that you have uh, pleading Obama there and you have encouraging words from President Bush and now you actually have a president who recognizes that there is a significant discrepancy, not just a fiscal discrepancy, but a moral discrepancy going on within NATO that fundamentally needs addressing. The American taxpayer, the American deplorables, have been expected now for decades to act as a protector for these protectorates uh, in Europe. All the while, European leaders are uh, insulting the United States, insulting President Trump most recently, and of course, as President Trump has pointed out, turning to Russia for gas when it's convenient for them, and then asking America to look after them militaristically. I mean, you know, the jig is up. And here in London, uh, I can tell you, you know, people are taking what President Trump is saying very, very seriously, because the United Kingdom is one of those few NATO member countries that does meet its 2% GDP, and we want everyone else to do the same in terms of defense spending too. Which is in part why Theresa May was so muted in her reaction to this, uh, not only her problems at home, but like, look, these, these numbers, Michael Sando, don't look great for the European contribution uh, to uh, the military budget of NATO. Let's check it out. Here are the countries that actually meet the 2%. As Raheem said, we, we, have, uh, we have the United Kingdom, of course, the United States, Estonia, Greece, and uh, half, my, half Pol my half Polish side says Poland, go Poland. Uh, so th those are the countries. Everybody else, you know, can't make it. You don't even have uh, Germany with all its money, including all of its money it's making off this Russian pipeline deal. Can't we got to wait till 2024 to get to to get to two percent? Most Americans watching this tonight going 2024. What are you talking about? Pony up the cash now, or maybe uh, maybe people don't get so much vacation in the summer subsidized by the state. Well, yes, I think that's a valid uh, concern that our allies need to step up, but we all need to step up right now because the Russian threat is more serious than it has been for many decades now. The Russians are probably moving nuclear weapons into Kaliningrad, which violate the INF Treaty. That's the most important treaty that Ronald Reagan was able to achieve, and Putin is violating it right now. They outgun us in the Baltic. So, yes, it's concerning that our allies are not doing as much as they can. But we also have to recognize that President Reagan and President George H.W. Bush heralded the end of the Cold War, and we don't want it to all fall apart on us. So we need to push our allies, yes. But NATO is the most powerful alliance in history, and we need to show Putin right. a resolve. To... I, I mean, I agree with you, Michael. I, I think you, it, is, it yeah. is the most powerful alliance, but it is not 1975. It's not 1985. This is the year 2018. Soviet Union collapsed 20 plus years ago. We're now dealing with a new dynamic. We're $20 trillion in debt. Europe's making buku cash, especially Germany, because of this sweetheart energy deal. This has been a source of consternation for the Eastern European allies of ours, too, for many years. They went ahead with it anyway in the spring, which I think was a slap in the face to America and to our, our allies, Poland, Estonia, the list goes on. They're not in favor of this pipeline. Notice that? They're right on the front lines. They don't no, want this well, pipeline. That's that is entirely, entirely true. But we also need to remember that we've been dealing with terrorists and insurgents. So the U.S. and our European allies have been largely focused in on insurgents and terrorists. And people need to understand that the Russian military has been focused in on defeating NATO. And the studies show if they attack Estonia, we do not have the forces in place. And the world's largest nuclear arsenal is Russia and not the United States. And we have to be careful with the finger pointing. Yes, Germany needs to spend right. more, but that okay. doesn't change that there is a real Russian threat. Okay, then they better start acting like it. They, Europe better start acting like it. Well, I got to go. Because yes. you met today with, uh, I think we even have a photo, but you met today with legislators from the European Parliament. Uh, a lot of people think Europe hates Trump, Europe hates Trump, Europe hates Trump. 
You found something different in your conversations today. What did you find? Absolutely. After three days of meetings between members of the European Parliament, members of the U.S. Congress, the myth that the so-called opposition media, mainstream media here, is presenting that everybody is united against President Trump is simply and accurate. Number one, you have countries inside Europe who align with President Trump on many issues, some on migration, some on defense. You have also Italy changing position, and even Germany. Do we know that now south of Germany, basically, is, is aligning with, with President Trump on some issues? The rise of populism, uh, which, which people like Richard Stengel, who was on MSNBC this morning, part of the parade of grim faces. It was like election night all over again. I, every time I see the faces, when their faces are grim, I'm almost always in a great mood. I was in a great mood this morning watching their reaction. Uh, and this, Rahim, is what Richard Stengel said uh, today after Donald Trump took on uh, Europe for failing to step up, many of these countries, for their military obligations to NATO. Let's watch. Let's also go back to why the European Union itself was formed. It was formed in the in the aftermath of World War II, where there was a poisonous nationalism that caused two world wars in the 20th century that killed more than 100 million people. The EU was meant to get around and away from that toxic nationalism, right? But who's bringing it back? Donald Trump. America first is toxic nationalism. Oh God. Again, Raheem, there is banality after cliche after bromide. Put it on a bumper sticker and try to sell it somewhere because Americans aren't buying that. Globalism gone awry is what gave birth to nationalism, where people are like, wait a second, why have my wages not gone up in like 20 years as all these guys keep getting richer uh, in the elite class? Your reaction to that toxic nationalism charge, given your association with Nigel Farage, UKIP, and the rise of, uh, of the movement in Europe? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've been doing this for years now, and whether you want to call it nationism or nationalism, some people call it populism or whatever. You know, you can put the word toxic in front of any word or phrase and suddenly it's an incredibly bad thing but actually what nationalism is to the peoples across Europe in Hungary, in Austria, in Italy, uh, in the United Kingdom with our Brexit vote, what it represents was actually, you know, we don't want our jobs sent abroad anymore. We quite like to manufacture things for ourselves. We quite like to control our own borders. What it is, is a return to the status quo. It's a return to normality. Not this sort of globalism on acid that we've become accustomed to. And I'm so glad that you have a president that sort of reflects a lot of those things. You know, you've got the lowest levels of black unemployment, uh, you know, the, ever. The lowest uh, levels of uh, Hispanic unemployment in decades. Does that chap want to call that toxic? Maybe he should call that toxic. Explain that to the minority communities well, would, across America. And I would the same also say wages are going Europe, up. Laura. Yeah, wages are going up. Italy's Absolutely. waking up. Austria has woken up. Poland. I think you're going to go down the list and you're going to see more European countries saying, wait a second, it's worked out for Germany okay, but a lot of these policies haven't worked out for our working class. Fascinating conversation, all of you. Great different insights and we really appreciate it. A former FBI attorney, by the way, trashed that candidate Trump and all those text messages, we'll remind you of them, refused to testify before Congress today. Republican Mark Meadows and attorney Alan Dershowitz will be here to explain what's going to happen next. The Mitsubishi Motors summer season pass sales event. 0% financing for 72 months. 